You could look at any existing socialist country, if you don't want to call them socialists, call them whatever you want, post-capitalist, whatever, I, I don't care, call it, call them camels, uh, window shades, doesn't matter, as long as we know the countries we're talking about. You can look at any one of those countries and you can evaluate them in several ways. One, comparing them to what they had before. And that to me is what's very compelling. That's what's so compelling about Cuba, for instance. When I was in Cuba, I was up in the Escambre, which is like the Appalachia of Cuba, very rugged mountains, the poor people, very poor if they were. And I said to this campesino, I said, do you like Fidel? And he says, si, sí, si, sí, with all our souls. He just, I remember his gesture, with all our souls. I said, why? And he pointed to this clinic right up there on the hill, which he had, we had visited. He said, look at that. He said, before the revolution, we never saw a doctor. If someone was seriously ill, it would take 20 people to carry that person because you'd go day and night. It would take two days to get to the hospital. First, because it was far away, and second, because you couldn't go straight. You couldn't cross the Latifundio lands. The boss would kill you. So you had to go like this. And often when we got to the hospital, the person might be dead by the time we got there. Now we have this clinic up here with a full-time doctor. And today, a doctor in Cuba, when you become a doctor, you've got to spend two years out in the country. That's your dedication to the people. And a dentist who comes one day a week. And for more serious things, we're not more than 20 minutes away from a larger hospital. That's in the Escambray. He said, that's freedom. We're freer today. We have more life. And I talked to a guy in Havana who says to me, before, all I used to see here in Havana, you call this drab and dull. We see it as a cleaner city. It's true, you got uh, the paint is peeling off the walls, but you don't see kids begging in the streets anymore. And you don't see prostitutes. All we said was prostitutes. Prostitution used to be one of the biggest industries. And today, this man is going to night school. He said, I can read. I can read. Do you know what it means to be able to read? Do you know what it means to be able not to read? I remember when I gave my book to my father, I dedicated a book of mine, Power and the Powerless, to my father. I said, to my father with my love. Gave him a copy of the book. He opened it up, looked at that. he only gone to the seventh grade. He was a son of an immigrant, a working class Italian. And he opens the book and he starts looking through it and he gets misty eyed, very misty eyed. And I thought it was because he was so touched that his son had, had dedicated a book to him. That wasn't the reason. He looks up to me and says, I can't read this, kid. I said, that's okay, Dad. Neither can the students. I mean, that's not something... I mean, don't, don't worry about that. I, I wrote it for you. I mean, it's your book, and uh, you don't have to read it. You know, it's a very complicated book, an academic book. He says, yeah, I can't read this book. And he just... And the defeat, the defeat that that man felt, that's what illiteracy is about. That's what the joy of literacy programs is. That's why in Nicaragua you got people walking proud now for the first time. They were animals before they weren't allowed to read. They weren't taught to read. So you compare a country to what it came from with all its imperfections. And those who demand instant perfection, the day after the revolution, they get up and say, are there civil liberties for the fascists? Are they going to be allowed to have their newspapers and their radio program? Are they going to be able to keep all their farms? The passion that some of our liberals feel the day after the revolution, the passion and concern they feel for the fascists, the civil rights and civil liberties of those fascists who were dumping and destroying and murdering people before. Now the revolution has got to be perfect. It's got to be flawless. Well, that isn't my criteria. My criteria is what happens to those people who couldn't read? What happens to those babies that couldn't eat, that died of hunger? And there, that's why I support revolution. The revolution that feeds the children gets my support. Not blindly, not unqualified. <laughs> and the Reaganite government that tries to stop that kind of process, that tries to keep those people in poverty and illiteracy and hunger, that gets my undiluted animosity and opposition.